Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coastal Drone Weekly Live. Uh, my name is Finn, and today we're going to talk about flying drones at night. The, this is a, a, a topic that sometimes comes up on the flight review, sometimes comes up in the written exam, so we're going to dive into some of the aspects about legal and practical aspects of flying your drone at night. By the end of today's talk, you're going to know what we consider night in the aviation world. What are the legal requirements for flying at night? What gear and lights are available, or what gear and lights you could add to your aircraft for flying at night? And uh, we're going to talk about capturing footage at night, some of the considerations you're going to need if you want to capture um, images or video at night. So the first question is, what is considered night? So night has a legal definition in aviation. And that legal definition is it's nighttime is defined as the time at the end of civil uh, twilight and the beginning of civil uh, twilight. So civil twilight is defined as any time when the sun's disk is zero to six degrees below the horizon. This is around 30 minutes after the sun, after the, the disk of the sun goes below the horizon. So it's zero degrees to six degrees. So it's about 30 minutes. So the sun sets, it goes below the horizon. It continues to go below the horizon after it dips about six degrees past the, um, the horizon that is considered nighttime. Then it is nighttime until the, as the sun is coming back up. When it hits six degrees below the horizon, it is now considered civil twilight again, and it is no longer considered night. This matters if you're flying in the States. In the United States, you need you need uh, certain, uh, there are certain certification requirements for flying at night. We're going to get into the laws here in Canada, um, and it's a little bit different. In Canada, what are the legal regulations and requirements? Well, the standard rules still apply. If it's over 250 grams, you need a basic or advanced certificate. The aircraft's registration number must be marked on the aircraft. You need to maintain visual line of sight, fly less than 400 feet AGL in uncontrolled airspace, and exercise respectful and safe flying. Now, what are the specific legal requirements tonight? So the, the regulation that governs uh, night flying is 901.39, which states, no pilot shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system during night unless the remotely piloted aircraft system is equipped with position lights sufficient to allow the aircraft to be visible to the pilot and any visual observer, whether with or without night vision goggles, and those lights are turned on. Pretty straightforward. You need to have vision lights, or you need to have lights on the aircraft that allow you to uh, determine where the aircraft is. Now, we've got the Mini 4 Pro here, and it has some vision lights. There, are, There's generally kind of two types of uh, vision lights on aircraft, not even just drones, but on aircraft. There's landing lights, and then there's position lights. So on the Mini 4 Pro, the landing light here is actually at the bottom. Um, it's currently, oops, it's currently not turned on, but if we were landing, it would, it's basically like a downward facing headlight and it would illuminate the ground underneath the aircraft. Now what that is going to allow it to do is the vision sensors will have a better sense of the ground. It's for mostly for landing. That's why we call it a landing light. And then the Mini 4 Pro also has these position lights on the rear arms of the aircraft. Now these position lights allow you to, um, judge the orientation of the aircraft. So if you only see one, only see one, then you can, or the angle of both of them, you can see where the aircraft is. Now, if the drone is facing you, like it's facing me like this, it's facing you like this, can you even see the rear position lights? So then, if you cannot actually see the rear position lights, does it count as meeting the night flying requirements? Potentially not. So we're going to talk about maybe adding additional lighting to your aircraft. Now, the other aspect is that no pilot shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system using night vision goggles unless the goggles are capable of, or the person has another means of detecting all light within the visual spectrum. So if you're wearing night vision goggles, you have to be able to disengage the night vision aspect and have it just be normal light, or be able to take the goggles on and off, or visual observer. And then it would be just like you're flying FPV. So a question is, will the landing light, will the position lights on your drone suffice? So what the regulation says is you need to keep the lights on, and the lights need to be sufficient that you can see the aircraft. I also think that it's helpful for if the lights are allow you to be able to uh, gauge the orientation of the aircraft. So on some models of the Mavic, the lights on the back and the lights on the front are different colors. So you can judge whether the aircraft is facing you or facing away from you. On normal air, on other aircraft, on our wingtip lights, uh, the the left the left wing tip will have a red light and the right wing tip will have a, a green light which will allow other aircraft to judge the orientation in which direction the aircraft is facing in. 
you want to be able to you need to be able to see the aircraft and you need to be able to see its orientation so that in the event that you need to land the drone you you fly it in the correct direction will the landing light on your drone suffice there's no there's no hard and fast rule in canada for how bright a light has to be um so it, some versions of other regulations it might say like it has to be this bright it has to have this many lumens it has to be visible from this specific distance um we don't have these kind of rule rules for drones um you just need to be able to see the aircraft so if you are flying the drone and you can see the see the landing lights see the position lights and you have a good you have a good understanding of where that drone is and that drone's orientation then i would consider those lights sufficient if you're having trouble seeing the drone um if you're having trouble gauging its orientation then you might need to add additional lighting to the drone or not fly that drone at night can you add additional lighting if you're adding additional lighting, you need to be aware of what, from a regulatory perspective, how that's going to affect your aircraft. If it's a micro drone like this and you add an additional light, um, that's going to most likely put it above 250 grams. If this drone is now above 250 grams, now basic certificate or advanced certificate are required, as well as, um, as, well as registering the aircraft and marking the aircraft's registration on the drone. If it's a drone that's above 250 grams and you're adding an additional light, you need to be cons are wary of the safety assurance declaration. Now, it's a little bit of a, a gray area whether or not adding a fixing an, an additional light could potentially violate or invalidate the safety assurance declaration. You kind of have to use your best judgment in this case. Um, most likely adding an additional light will not completely invalidate the safety assurance declaration is not going to affect the gps and it's most likely not going to affect how the aircraft behaves potentially adding exterior position lights either with a velcro patch or something is not going to immediately invalidate the safety insurance declaration but you need to use your best judgment and you need to be aware of potentially how that can affect your aircraft now some larger drones they have larger lights and you can affix things like spotlights to them and stuff that's a bit of a different story if the aircraft is not designed to hold a payload then you have to be careful when you're adding um additional equipment onto that aircraft. Some best practices for conducting night operations, scout the route in the daytime and on the night for obstacles. If, if you're able to go there before the sun sets, then you'll have a better, you'll be able to see things more easily. If you wear sunglasses 30 to 60 minutes prior to the beginning of night, it will um, help your eyes to adjust. Avoid the use of phones or other screens, especially things with that have like blue light as um, looking at a phone screen will basically instantly unadjust your eyes to tonight and they will all have to spend time readjusting tonight when you're flying at night there's a number of illusions that can affect your eyes at night some of them would be empty field myopia there's other types of illusions and all of these illusions are caused by fixating on one point so some things that can happen so let's talk about empty field myopia if you are staring at a barren landscape or a barren sky, your eyes will very, very slowly start to readjust, and they will actually the, their their focal length, their focus will be on about five to ten meters in front of you, which means that if you're looking at the sky, your eyes will slowly defocus away from the sky into a, and they will focus on what's in front of you, which will affect your ability to actually scan for obstacles. Other things that can happen if there's a single light, a single star, it may appear to move. I think this is called autokinesis. This this light, even though it is not moving, it will appear to move back and forth if it's the only light in the sky. You have to be aware of these illusions that can happen at night. And the best way to combat all of the illusions is do not fixate on any one point. Keep your eyes moving in short scanning motions. You can um, We call it a VW scan because it either looks like a V or a W. But you look up at the sky and you basically go drone down near the drone down and you go across the sky in a vw formation in order to um allow your eyes to can or allow your eyes to continue to readjust refocus and uh scan the sky other best practices you can use a visual observer um you it may be difficult to detect incoming aircraft so your first indication will be the sounds of the engine keep a closer eye on your battery and it can sometimes be, especially if you're trying to capture video, it might be a good idea to fly slower than normal. Do not rely on your drone's obstacle avoidance at night, especially some of these smaller drones. Their obstacle avoidance is based on uh, cameras as opposed to LiDAR. If the vision systems are based on cameras, well, if there's not enough light going into the camera, it's not really going to be able to see an obstacle. It's not going to be able to avoid an obstacle.
So let's talk about some gear. Some companies sell external strobe lights. These are normally powered by like a button cell battery, something like that. It's a small LED. And with Velcro, you can attach it to the drone. Now, as we talked about, you have to be aware of how that can affect your aircraft and make sure that it would not violate the aircraft's safety assurance declaration. And then if you're adding it to a micro drone, you need to make sure that it is not putting it above the, the weight category if you're still trying to fly it as a micro drone. Now let's talk about capturing uh, some footage at night. So capturing footage at night is more challenging than capturing it into the daytime. And part of that is just because there's less light. So a camera sensor, basically it detects light. If there's less light, there's less for it to detect. Some of these slides are from our, um, our video specifically on cameras and how cameras work and capturing camera footage. So if you are interested in that, you can go watch that video. It's uh, from the beginning of the year. One of the things that affects how cameras uh, um, capture light is the aperture of the camera. This is literally the size, so the lens opens and there's a hole. The aperture is the size of the hole. A bigger hole will let l more light onto the sensor and a smaller hole will uh, let less light onto the sensor. We measure this in, in, in F number or F stops. Um, this is also called the focal length. This is the millimeters that the aperture is open. The longer the lens and the smaller the F number, the bigger the aperture is open. Most uh, these small consumer drones have fixed aperture lenses, which means that you cannot change how big that hole is. That hole is as big as it's ever going to be. It's not going to get bigger, not going to get smaller. Higher end professional level air, uh, drones have variable apertures. Um, and you can see here, most of them vary between 2.8 to 11 and then most of the the fixed ones are normally 2.2 2.8 or 1.7 having a variable aperture gives you more options when you're when you're flying when you're trying to capture footage another thing to be aware of is shutter speed that's how so there's a, a the the shutter on the lens is like a gate it opens and it closes how fast that that gate that shutter opens and closes will affect the image they are normally measured in in how long is just how long it's open if you see one over a hundred it's a one one hundredth of a second a slower shutter speed will let in more light but there will also be more motion blur and a faster shutter speed less light but it will freeze motion so when if you're watching a hockey game the person in the corner with the anybody shooting sports not just hockey the person in the corner with the camera when you're doing sports photography you have to have basically like the the fastest shutter speed of all time, and that's one of the reasons why their lenses are so chonky, um, because they need to they need to capture a lot of light in a very very short amount of time because you want to freeze that that um that sporting motion. And then we have ISO. ISO is how sensitive the sensor is to light. I, ISO is kind of funny. Do you Cam? Do you know about uh, film ISO or how you change the ISO on a film camera? I actually don't that's a good question i'm mainly i've experimented a little bit with film but mainly just digital stuff so iso on a film camera this is how you change it when you're developing the film you use a different type of film you base the only way to change iso on a film camera w would be to purchase another roll of film that is a di that is a different sensitivity to light so when you put that film in the can so when you back in the day when you were purchasing when you were purchasing a roll of film to put into your film camera, you would either purchase an ISO 1000, an ISO 800, and then, and then if you purchased a film, a roll of film that was the wrong ISO, it would be, uh, it would be tough luck, and you would either have to just waste the rest of the roll because it's a roll of film, or shoot with a not spectacular ISO. So it's actually pretty cool now that we can change, change ISO. My my personal camera goes up to ISO 3200, which is like kind of middle of the road you can get cameras that go like iso like 6400 even higher than that um basically the higher the iso the more sensitive the the sensor is to light which means two things if you were in a low light scenario you might see more stuff but also there's going to be more noise now the noise is caused by there's more kind of like there's more electricity moving through the sensor and that causes more noise. And also if there's very slight variations in, in how much light something is outputting, you're going to see that in the ISO. Changing the, um, changing the f-stop will change the amount of uh, blur in the background. Changing the shutter speed will change amount of, the amount of blur in the, um, in the image. And then increasing the ISO will increase the sensitivity but also increase the noise. There's something called the exposure triangle. Basically, aperture, shutter, ISO, they have a three-way relationship and you have to kind of keep them in balance. 
if you start to decrease the ISO, decrease the aperture, decrease the shutter speed, you may have to increase uh, one of the other ones. So if I if I went from an ISO of 100, or sorry, if I went from an ISO of 1600 to an ISO of 100, I would potentially have to either decrease my shutter speed, increase my f st or my f stop, in order to make sure that there's enough light going on the sensor. Because you have to remember, a camera is literally just like it is opening a hole. Light is going into a sensor. If you start to decrease the amount of light that can enter the sensor, you're either going to have to compensate by increasing the sensitivity, or letting more light in in another way. Some of our aircraft have what is called night mode. Uh, night mode will boost the ISO. It will try to improve the sharpness. I can't recall if they improve the sharpness digitally, like as an effect, or if it if it actually is able to focus a little bit better. And it will try to reduce the noise. Now, one of the things you can also do is you can also reduce the noise in post. Um, as, uh, using a program like Lightroom, you can actually reduce the noise in post processing. They have noise reduction tools and actually sharpness increasing tools. Um, which will allow you to change that. If you shoot in RAW, you can also change the ISO, which is kind of cool. Just a note on ISO as well. Like Brent saying, for sports, uh, you used 800 film. Uh, anything worse was grainy. And, and yeah, especially like in a like in a dimly lit kind of area uh, with sports, like if you're in a gym or, or an arena too, it's um, the lighting conditions are are not great. Uh, at least like our human eyes can see pretty well, obviously, but in terms of like a camera's uh, point of view, the lighting conditions are not ideal. No, so sports photographers use, you look at those lenses and those lenses cost more than my car <laughs> um, and Cam's car put together, <laughs> probably. Uh, they're, not, they're not cheap pieces of kit. So yeah, so Brent uses the term grain. Noise and grain are kind of uh, synonymous terms. So the older term is grain, uh, the newer term is noise. This was uh, during the, um, the Aurora Borealis, this was one of Ian's uh, uh, hyperlapses where you could he you can see it it is a little bit there is a little bit of noise in the top there but you can see that there's um that he he, he got some pretty good pretty good captures using a hyperlapse so this is taking a photo every couple of seconds this is a, a very very famous uh drone video from hong kong and it does so it, it has the the style which is known as cyberpunk which is um uh, inspire that th this visual style is inspired by the movie Blade Runner. It is like this video as well is is super like mind blowing, and not only do they have a um, a fantastic um, and incredible subject being the city, um, but it looks like they're using like I mean it could be done in post, but it looks like they're using either like a mix of like FPV mode on the actual drones itself, like on the actual like traditional drones, mm -hmm. or if they're flying uh, an actual FPV drone or doing it post to kind of warp yeah. that. And part of and part of what is the advantage of flying in a place like Hong Kong, and, and this is from a couple years ago, so I don't know if the regulations are the same, but um, this this a video that is similar to this could not be shot in Canada because this violates like half of the cars <laughs> half of this is beyond line of sight they flew through the clouds at one point which is i don't think is legal um and they're flying over people they're flying near people but it's still pretty cool we'll have a link to the full video in the description below and then other things that you can do at night is they using a thermal camera they helped to rescue a lost hiker and you can see this is what it would look like in the actual um to the actual camera and then this is what the thermal camera saw so being able to use an aircraft at night can enhance human vision and this helps um, find someone who is lost so that's it for the slides here i'm gonna open it up to questions we'll um i'll wait about a minute or so if anybody has a question or a thought about flying at night is there anything like obviously like watching for obstacles and that but i'm just thinking of like that um search and rescue scenario as well is there anything that is there anything that you should do differently just in terms of a pre-flight check uh or a site survey uh especially when flying at night anything that's particular to flying at night uh well because you need the lighting available you would definitely want to double check that your that the lights work <laughs> um that they're not like the they're normally leds on these drones which leds last a very long time but you know maybe they come loose or something like that so you definitely want to double check that all the lights are functioning and then in terms of the site survey checking for obstacles um you de you would want to look 
it would be beneficial to be able to either look at Google Maps if you're doing the site survey at night or do the site survey during the day. Things like um, trees, if they're on the backdrop of other trees, or um, uh, power lines or telephone wires are much, much more challenging to see at night because they will blend in with the background. So you want to really you want to know where the obstacles are before you take off the aircraft because you're not going to be able to see them and the obstacle avoidance won't be able to see them either. I'll throw this one, just kind of thinking off the top of my head too. Sure. Is there anything just for, like, regarding, like, aviation um, and flying just in controlled air, or, like, uh, uncontrolled airspace, rather? Is there anything in the aviation world that kind of translates to flying a night for uh, drones? Well, in... In traditional aviation, you actually um, you require additional training to fly at night. So you actually need to get a night rating in order to fly during the time of night. So for drones, it's actually kind of cool. You don't need any additional training or rating to fly at night. It's the aircraft that needs to be capable of flying at night. If I want to, I I hold a night rating. Um, so, but I needed it, I needed additional training in order to be able to fly at night. And then to carry passengers at night, you, would need to, you needed to have done five takeoffs and landings within the past six months um, in order to carry a passenger at night. Brent's saying in the chat here, uh, I set waypoints um, wave in the daytime, then rely on those waypoints at night. And that's actually a really, really good idea. Yeah, if you're able to plan out the waypoints prior and know that they'll, the, those will avoid obstacles, then yeah, that's a great strategy for being able to avoid obstacles at night. I think as well in the Mini 4... I think it was the Mini 4 trailer from DJI, the launch trailer and release. They actually showed um, how you can um, basically set, they do exactly what Brent is saying and set waypoints and then do like a day versus night shot. It was kind of like one of their promo materials. Yeah, yeah, and that, that because you can save the waypoints and if it's a known, if it's a known not obstacle filled area, then you'll be able to avoid those obstacles as long as the aircraft is able to follow the waypoints. But remember, you need to be able to see the aircraft. So I know that some, I don't know if this is still the case, but at some point DJI drones, when you, if you were going to take an image, it would actually turn all the external lights off. And I, I always felt that that maybe that, that, that was um, potentially a car's violation because it says that you need to, that the lights need to be on in the cars. It even, it, it says it. As well as like for the camera side, like you can like I know we touched about um, touched on uh, exposure and that and shutter speed, and you can just get some really mind blowing stuff. Um, like we saw with the video, but also like in terms of photography and that, um, you can get these really cool. Um, I'm blanking right now, but it's um, it's a hyperlapse, but it's a long ex long exposure yeah. photos and that. So if you're like hovering over a city or like want to get like the common one we see is like light trails of cars. Yeah, and car headlights and stuff. That that's using a, a long, or a, the shutter is open for a very long time and the car drives through and then it captures the light at every point. And then as well, just light painting as well, uh, and that's something we'll we'll yeah. try and do as well. Close to the winter is. Yeah, Ian and Cam are are hoping to 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 film some some light painting with their drone. If you've enjoyed this content, uh, you can hit the like button below. If you really enjoyed it, you can hit the subscribe button. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on another episode of Coastal Drone Weekly Live. If you're interested in attending this live, you can find it in our community, community.coastaldrone.co. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.